Everyone, praise the Lord. <laughs> How is everyone? Woo, yeah. I love it. Welcome to Bringing Families Back Ministries, where we don't play church. I tell people, you know, pray with me, don't play with me. All right, yeah, we're going to get, get hood and holy up in here. Let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. I pray the Holy Spirit really touches us with this word today and that we could surrender to God's will, God's ways in our life. And we've been going through this series called hashtag oil carriers. Why? Our ability to have what I call oil awareness, oil awareness, meaning can I discern if this person has oil? Can I discern if this person really has oil? Like, I don't care if you got Jeremiah 29 tatted on you. Are you living it, not just looking the part? Like, there's a lot of people that go to church, but they carry no oil. So today, we're gonna, I'm going to teach y'all how to be able to, to birth oil, how to birth real oil that comes from heaven. Because we need oil. I think some of us, we got slain at the altar seven years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, right? We got slain at the altar and then we're taking that same old oil. Some of us need an oil change into this next season. It's not going to work. You got to birth new oil. You need a fresh oil change. And I believe God's people needs this so that we can continue to carry whatever glory God has placed inside of us. The, the he that is within you that is greater than he that is within this world. And I pray that God raises up a generation of people that aren't just having lip service, but living service. Can I live this walk, right? Some people are holding hands with the devil and saying that God is speaking to them. What if that's the devil's voice? Because you know, there's different voices out there, right? We got the devil's voice. We got, we got the, the world's voice, the godless society out there. We even got our own flesh, our voice. We got people that are bumping to worldly music saying they hear from God. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Because it depends, it, it's kind of like frequency when you hear from God. Frequency, like there's a frequency in the radio when I'm trying to listen to a voice. And I told God, God, if you just show it to me, if you want me to do it, God, and I hear it from you, I'm going to obey you as long as it comes from you. So God, show me. Today, we're going to be talking about prayer. And we're in Matthew 6. But I have, I have a question to ask us. Where is the most powerful place to pray? Where is the most powerful place to pray? This is going to be the question that's going to be answered throughout this journey and this, this little side talk today. Where is the most powerful place to pray? I'm telling y'all, pray with me, don't play with me today. But where is that? And that question is answered by Jesus himself. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 6. Let's read this. I'm going to highlight some things before we get into it. It says, but you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, just remember this. Okay, remember these things. Go into your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. But you, this is Jesus speaking, but you, when you pray, meaning Jesus is not saying if you pray, it's not an option, it is mandatory for the believer to pray. When you pray, go into your room. This is a new King James. King James version says, go into your closet. Go into your closet. And when you have shut your door, I'm sure a lot of us have heard this before, y'all. You know how many times I've read this? When you shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray right now, oh God, that you would enlighten the eyes of our understanding. I pray that you would enter our hearts, that we may receive the wisdom, the revelation, the instruction, that it might be the same verse, but a new rema. It might be a same verse that we've heard over and over and over again, but a fresh revelation, a fresh anointing, fresh oil to be dropped from heaven. Open up the floodgates over this word, God. 
and may the oil drip from heaven because you anoint it, you anoint our heads with the oil and the cup will overflow. So I pray an overflow over this word in this moment in Jesus' name. But when you pray, when you pray, go into your room, go into your closet. Now, I just wanna share something. How many of us have seen in scripture when Jesus prays inside a closet? Show me a scripture where Jesus is going into a closet. I don't see. And that's the thing about his words, that Jesus is always speaking in parables. Why? And we, we learned this last week. They, them, they, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. Why does Jesus speak to them in parables? They, they, them. But I've never seen in scripture where Jesus is going into a closet with his disciples or just going into a closet by himself just to pray. And when you do go into that room, when you do go into the closet, shut the door. So we're answering a question today, where is the most powerful place to pray? I was looking up that word room, which is closet in Greek, because remember, Jesus, there are deeper things to the scripture. You know how, how the worldly people, they'd be like, it ain't that deep, bro. It's deep. And I'm going to give you scripture. The, the book of Corinthians says this. It says that it is the spirit that searches the deep things of God. I'm, I'm just going scripture. Okay, this ain't my opinion. So it is, the, it is the spirit of God that searches the deep things of God. Whenever someone says it ain't that deep, I ask, are you that deep with God? Because you got to be able to search the deep things of God. So I looked up this word in Greek. Room, closet. The Greek word is tamayan. Tamayan, tamayan. That's the Greek word. And here's what it means. It means storage chamber. This is closet. This is room. Storage chamber. It says it's another, another uh, definition is inner chamber. Inner chamber. Secret room. Others call it a treasury room. It is this chamber, this inner chamber. So again, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm here to teach this, okay? This is not, we're not here to hype us up. I want us to get some real wisdom so that we can actually launch and have an effective prayer life. Because what if you're praying prayers that you're asking God to bless that hell is sending? What if hell is sending things in a form of blessings that you're asking God to bless, but he's not going to bless what the gates of hell is sending your way? What if God is blocking that? What if God is saying, hey, I'm trying to show you that these prayers are not of me? So how do I pray effectively? Jesus opens this up. And remember, man, this Jesus is so deep, right? He's so deep. But when you pray, go into your closet, go into your room, go into your storage chamber, go into your secret room, go into your inner chamber. I was doing a study on the heart. Did y'all know the heart has four chambers? So God says, go into your chamber. Go into your heart. Go into your inner chamber. The heart has four different chambers. And what it's showing me is when we're going into our chamber, when we're going into our room, when we're going into our closet, when we're praying, where is the most powerful place to pray? Right here. When you're praying, this is what God wants. He wants your inner chamber. That's why it doesn't matter if you're praying for two minutes or two hours. You might not be in your inner chamber of your heart with God because, and you're praying for two hours, but your prayers are vanity. This is why people will misinterpret this part of scripture. And when you have shut your door. What does that mean? The distractions, the cares of this world, the bills that are due at the end of the week, the, the things that are distracting you. When you're praying, what does God want? He wants your heart. That's all the Lord wants. I might not know when you're praying. We could discern it at times, but not all the time. God can all the time. That's why when you read in verse five, a lot of religious folks and legalistic people they will misinterpret this. Verse 5, Matthew 6, 5, And when you pray, you shall not 
be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they might be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, we're not against praying publicly. The legalistic and the people that don't understand this, they will say, you can't be praying publicly. That's how they're going to take this scripture. It's okay to pray publicly. What's the issue is the heart when you're praying publicly. Are you in your inner chamber? Are you giving God your heart? Are you going into your secret place and pulling from that because your father that lives in the secret place sees the things that you're doing in secret? So it's not saying that we can't pray publicly. It's saying, where is it coming from? Is it coming from the inner chamber of your heart? Is it coming from that closet? Or is it coming from that secret room, that treasury room? Skip to verse 7. And when you pray, do not use repetition as the heathen do. For they, they think that what w- they will be heard for their many words. <laughs> this is why you get people that aren't, they're just praying like it's a religious practice. I'm just praying because it's a religious practice. It's checklist Christianity is what these people do. Checklist. Let me just check it off. God, I want to look the part, but am I living the part? Jesus is the one that's rebuking the Pharisees. But he's the one that's sitting with the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the sinners. Why? It's their heart. I think God is raising up a radical remnant today that, hey, like we welcome everyone in here. I wel- we welcome everyone. You can belong before you believe. But once you start spewing your demonic beliefs, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Once you start spewing your cancer that comes from the world, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus because that's not of God. When you start teaching your false doctrine and your false spirituality with the crystals and the rocks that are hanging, not the rock, Jesus Christ, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. You guys see the difference that we, we accept you, we, we want you, but when it comes to doctrine, I can hear you, but I don't receive you. Why? We don't follow our heart. We follow Jesus. But this just feels right. That's your soul, your emotions, your feelings. That's that's part of your soul. We got to be able to allow this soul to be restored, renewed. We're not here to be soul led, but bro, this feels right. It might feel right, but is it righteousness according to God? And when you pray, verse 7 again, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Oh, he calls them heathens. Jesus is a gangster, y'all. He says, don't, don't do these vain, repetitious, rhetoric type of religious types of prayers like the heathens do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. That's what the enemy does. This is what these dysfunctional people do. They just talk, talk the talk. It's a lot of talk. A lot of words, but very little weight in the spiritual realm. A lot of words, but very little weight in the kingdom. I want people that have oil, that carry authority in their prayers, in their praise, in their proclamation, in their words that are influenced by the anointed one, the Messiah, King Jesus himself, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Valley of Sharon, the Lily of Valleys, the the great I am, the, the, the shepherd, the door. He says, I am the door. Verse eight. Therefore, do not be like them. (laughs) Here's that them again. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. I love how Jesus says when you pray. And he says this several times in verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. When you pray. Prayer prayer is like oxygen for the believer. Prayer is like oxygen. That's why it says pray without ceasing. It's not about a two-minute prayer or a two-hour prayer. It's, is it coming from the secret place? Is it coming from the secret room? Is it coming from the inner chamber of your heart? And I love this, where Jesus never taught his disciples how to preach. He taught his disciples how to pray. And you'll see that as you continue to read the rest of these scriptures. Well, everyone wants to learn how to preach, let me preach to that person. Pre- Everyone, by the way, preaching is not churchy. Preaching is, is all around. 
Like, I got a homie that doesn't believe in God. He's preaching to me his demonic doctrine. Well, bro, I ain't on Jesus' side. I'm not on that side. I'm, a, I'm doing me. Doing you is either influenced by the devil or Jesus. There's no other kingdom. There's either the kingdom of God or the kingdom of darkness. So my question is, is doing you doing daddy devil? The, the father of, of life or the father of lies? Because doing you is either one kingdom or the other. There's no in between. And until you can get that, you're always going to walk in deception thinking you doing you, boo-boo. Therefore, do not be like them. For your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. God already knows. And remember where we said, it says, it says this, but when you pray, go into your room, go into your inner chamber, go into the deep parts of your heart. Like, I don't care if you just got saved two weeks ago. If you're praying from your heart, I receive that oil. I receive the glory of God. I receive the revelation of the Holy Spirit. I receive that. God's not looking for a long prayer. He's looking for a fervent, effective prayer of a righteous person that makes much more available. We'll go into that scripture in in James here. But when you pray, I'm going to keep reading this, go into your inner chamber, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, that's the next thing. This is a formula that when I'm going into the deep parts of my heart and some of us We're out here trying to pray. Imagine you praying every day for hours and hours and hours, but you're not going into the inner chambers of your heart. Are you just praying some some vanity, repetitious prayers? That's the difference from someone that can just pray and shut every. So when I'm praying, though, I have to shut the door. I have to shut the noise. I have to shut the distraction. I have to shut the worry. I have to shut the anxiety. I have to shut the fear that the Lord is inside. I got to let everything go and just be focused on the Father. And you guys will have some effective prayer lives. You don't have to know all the Bible. You don't have to know that there's 66 books in the Word of God. You just got to love Jesus. And you just got to open your mouth and cry out, Abba, Father. And watch God move. I don't want people to think that you have to know all these scriptures in order to pray. Just start talking to him. Prayer is my language of communication to God. It's just how I communicate to him. It's so beautiful what God can do in those moments. It's so beautiful how God can just hear me. The the Bible says he hears the cries of the righteous. Now we're talking about the heart, right? In the same chapter in verse 21, remember the inner chamber the secret room, the storage chamber, the treasure room. In verse 21, it says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I'm not talking about just worldly possessions. I'm talking about what do you idolize? I'm up front. I got, a, I got some a decent size of influence out there on social media, but I can never idolize that. When I remember getting banned on TikTok, God really, really did some stuff with my life. He removed it. Why? The question is this. Whatever your heart is tied to is, your, is where your identity is tied to. So I'm not going to sit up here and say I was perfect. No. In fact, delivering messages like this, God does some crushing, some, 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 some pressure in, the, in private that a lot of people don't see in your walk with the Lord. That's why you're so strong with God. Like some of us in here don't look like what we've been through because that's how good our God is. Because you don't look like what the manipulator, the abuser, the deceiver, the dysfunctional toxic people have done to you. You don't look like it, but you're still here breathing, living with a sound mind because of our living God. Some of us don't even look like that but I thank God for being here. There's a level of praise that I got to give God because of who I am and where I am and him getting me out of that place that I thought I would have never. Thank God that season passed. Thank God that God took me through that. I couldn't have done that stuff alone by the grace of God. Now, let's go to 1 Samuel 16. We're talking about oil. We're talking a lot about oil. And this is a place where the newest king is getting anointed. You know, we talk a lot about Saul and David, 
But there is a new king that needs to get anointed. Why? Saul was once chosen. And this is where I tell people in the body of Christ. God could have chose you in one season, but your disobedience is what removes you from the position that God ordained you in. Your disobedience is dethroning the King Saul's. The King Saul's right now. So you could have been act, you could have had a, a can or a, a bottle of act right, act righteousness in one season, but you acting like a fool in this season. You will be de dethroned. Bible all day. This is why we have a king maker named Prophet Samuel who obeys the voice of God, hears the voice of God. This is why we have a kingmaker going to anoint a new king. And even this prophet, this man of God. By the way, y'all, Prophet Samuel, you read about his story? He was a gangster prophet. Like he would go to, to cities and the, the scripture says this, that people would be under the fear, they'd be in fear of Prophet Samuel because they knew God's hand was on his life. That the people would be in fear because they knew that God's hand was on him because anything God told him, he would do. I, was, I had a uh, talk with pastor the other day. I remember pastor telling me, yeah, just pray that I hear it because I told God, if I hear it clear from you, I'm going to obey no matter what it looks like. Y'all, that's a deep word because we want what we want. Do we want what God wants? Get around some people that when God makes it clear that you need to cut that off, that you need to execute this, that you need to launch into glory, that you need to let go of the old. When God makes it clear, Lord, I'm obeying your word. I'm obeying your voice. Get around some real disciples that will do that when God makes it clear, plain, when you're writing the vision on plain tablets and run with that. Run with that. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, Prophet Samuel looks and is like, this has to be the one I got to anoint, right? Let's go to verse 6. So he sees Jesse, who is the father of David, and then all the brothers. And in verse 6, so it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. You, you see this, like we might look at people and be like, this is the one I have to anoint. This is the one I got to partner with. Man, they serve in church and they're speaking in tongues publicly, but they're cursing their children and their spouse privately. Surely they look good out there. I want us to be able to discern oil that doesn't just look like it's oil on the outside, but it's real oil on the inside. That's why we're going through this series. Oil awareness is our ability to discern oil on somebody's life. Like you don't have to tell me you're a pastor. You don't have to tell me you're a prophet. You don't have to tell me you're an apostle. You don't have to tell me you a gangster evangelist, evangelist that is out there casting out demons and doing deliverance out there in the marketplace. You don't have to tell me I could just see the glory of God in you and on you. Go to verse seven. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. Like it doesn't matter if you got all these piercings, you got three piercings on this side, piercings on this side. It doesn't matter if you're all tatted and yatted all around. It doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. It's the heart. It's the heart. Like I don't care if the church is big. I love big churches, but what I care more is do they have a big heart for God? Doesn't matter how small, doesn't matter how big. Is their heart big for God? I don't care if the, close, the, the church is close to me, right down the street from me. There's a lot of churches that are close to me, but they're operating out of legalism. They're operating off a religious spirit, off ideologies and doctrines of demons. This is what the, the book of Revelation tells us, synagogues of Satan. It doesn't matter if the church is close to me. The question is, is, are those people close to God's heart? And David is known as what? A man that is after God's heart. Those are the people that we have to be assigned to. Like, man, Lord, I see that the heart, that the soil is pure. It's ready. It's willing to receive. It is a heart that is burning, but it's a heart that needs instruction. It's a heart that needs to be led and guided. And it's a heart that the devil would try to attack because it's so vulnerable. My heart is for those people. 
that are open to spirituality, that are open to learning about the Bible, but a demonic doctrine has plagued their mind, has filled their heart. Those are the people I want us to capture. These are the people that I want us to minister to, to be able to share God's word. I want us to be so in, in, in the fear and in the love of the Lord that we will not do bad towards people and souls because of our love for God. Because if God gave you that, if he allowed you to encounter this, if you have a relationship for the, with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, why not allow that to transfer to others? And show them what you're encountering because some people, they won't believe you, but they will believe when they get a real encounter with the king. But the Lord's, Lord said to Samuel, this is, again, this is a gangster prophet, y'all. This guy, is a, he's a warrior prophet. And he also saw it. He saw, he's like, Eliab, this guy has to be the anointed one. And then God intercedes. This is why you have to always be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. It doesn't matter how long you've been in ministry, how long you prayed this morning, how many church services you've been to. How many Bible studies you came to in this past season? It's the heart. Do not look at his appearance or at the physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward, but the Lord looks at the heart. Go, to, go back to Matthew 5. What your heart is tied to becomes your identity. If your heart is tied to relationships, a relationship, if your heart is tied and bound to your bank account, if your heart is tied and bound to your employer, if your heart is tied and bound to your toxic ex that you still feel find worth in, if your heart is bound to any of these things, idolatry at its finest. Idolatry is just anything you put above God. I'm not saying your parents aren't important. I'm not saying your civic other isn't important. I'm not saying that your wife or your husband is not important. I'm saying is God taking real estate above all? That's it. Love thy Lord God with all thy heart, might, strength, soul. They asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says to love thy Lord God with all thy, and I think heart is there for a purpose. Heart, might, strength, soul. And then it says, then love thy neighbor as you love yourself. Love others just as like you love yourself. Like I got to forgive myself. I got to also love myself. Like some seasons you got to water you. You're drowning and you're trying to help other people drowning while you're drowning. You have to love yourself. You have to forgive yourself so you can help other people. We, and it's crazy because there's so many people in the body of Christ that want to help others, but they're drowning. Because they want to look like they're doing ministry. God wants to save you out of that so you can help others. He wants you to get healthy. He wants your heart to get right so that you can have a little bit of that blessing so you can bless other people. And I believe God has blessed me to help bless people that God has assigned me for. And I believe God, he might not bless you with a million dollars in your bank account, but he'll bless you with a little bit extra in profit this month with your bills. So you can bless somebody else, one person, two people, three people, whoever that is. But let the Lord touch your heart. Matthew chapter five, verse eight. Blessed are the pure in heart. Again, this is all Jesus' words. This was God's words. We're just, I'm just going into what the word of God says. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God. They shall see God. Can I just tell y'all, there is power in purity, but there is also power in prayer that is backed up by purity. Whew, glory to that. Because when I'm pure, I see God. So my heart is aligned with God. Blessed are those that are pure in the heart for they shall see God. Can I just give you guys another bar that you should write down in your notes? Purity attracts God. Purity attracts God. With a Netflix and chill type of culture. With a culture that looks at people as figures and we just want to use them so we can fulfill our own lust. We got demonic industries out here that are all transactional. If they do that for me, I'm going to do this for them. Right? And we talk so much about discernment in this house. We're not going to go deep into that today. But I'm just sharing like this is where it's like, can I see God in this? When your heart is pure, you can see God. But when you pray, 
Go into your inner chamber. Go into the inner chambers of your heart. And when you are praying and you go into your secret place, you go into your inner room. And this can be anywhere and everywhere. You can go anywhere and pray as long as your heart is right with God. And you, but you, here's the thing. The next thing you have to do, shut your door. Shut the door behind you. Distractions, noise, worry of where is the next dollar going to come so I can pay my bills, worry about what's going on with my spouse, worry about my children and all that. Just, just, just take that all out. And in this moment, just give it to God and watch him move. I believe that prayer is going to allow us to move like never before in such a different way. This is the power of prayer. But also, I'm really ushering a little bit of purity in here because purity is what's going to allow us to accelerate these prayers. Go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 in the New Testament. Are we learning something? <laughs> Are we seeing the scriptures a little bit differently today? Same scriptures, new oil. Same scriptures, new wineskin. Same scriptures, but a different revelation. I know God is knocking at the doors of people's heart today. I know that God is tugging at people's heart today. I know that what you've gone through and what you've been through, you just know that that was God. And when you can acknowledge him in all thy ways, he will direct your path moving forward. I'm acknowledging that that was a coincidence. That was God in the midst of it. I'm acknowledging that it was him, even though it doesn't look like it, because he's moving even when we don't see that he's moving. You know, James is uh, the half-brother of Jesus. It says this, and I'm just going to read James 1 real quick. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ooh, this is so humble, y'all. This is so humble. He doesn't say, yo, I'm James. You know, I, I'm, I'm connected to Jesus. I'm the half-brother. Y'all better bow down and listen to me because I'm so connected to Jesus. He says, no, James, a bond servant. He, he labels himself as a servant. As a servant. God is looking for servants. While you and your dysfunction want other people to serve you, God wants you to serve him. It becomes manipulation and abuse when I want other people to serve me. Versus me serving the living God. If Jesus came to be served, not to serve, or if Jesus came to serve, not to be served, what more? What more? James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's go to chapter 5, verse 16. James 5, 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. It says this, confess your trespasses to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, long three-hour prayer. Oh, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, of a righteous person, avails much. Ooh, so much weight in that. That word fervent is to be operative, to put faith, to put, to put forth power a fervent prayer. And another, another definition is a passionate prayer. Like, God, I just want to give you my heart. I don't want to just look like I, I know how to pray. I'm just, Lord, I don't even know. I'd, I'd ra I love the, the person that's like, God, I just don't know what to pray. I don't even know that much scriptures, but God, I just want you to move. I love that prayer when it comes from the heart. Like, you don't need to know it all, y'all. You could pray. Father, I don't even know this. I don't know what to say. I'm just being led and never let that condemnation come upon you. Don't let that guilt or shame of not knowing scripture come upon you. God's not looking at that. He's looking at the heart. The effective, fervent, which is passionate prayer. It's to display one activity. That's what fervent is. It's to be operative. It's to be at work. When I'm working that soil, when I'm working that prayer with just me and the living God. Of a righteous person avails much. What does that mean? It makes much more available. Prayer makes much more available. But my next question, and we talked about this last week, are you available? God is able, but are you available? 
God, I'm available. I'm emptying myself right now. I don't know what to say. I don't know what I'm going to teach sometimes. I don't even know what's going to come out of my mouth. But Lord, just let it please not be something of dysfunction. I'll be praying that sometimes. I'm like, Lord, I'll be getting some crazy thoughts sometimes, right? Like, I'm telling y'all, like, the enemy comes. It doesn't matter how much of the word you got, God you know. Thoughts come. These intrusive thoughts that I got to take into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. They come. I'm like, Lord, shut my tongue if it ain't of you. In Jesus' name. Verse 17, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I love that because we all see Elijah. We don't idolize Elijah. We honor his ministry and what he did with God. He was a nature like ours. Elijah was just another man like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Wow. The power of prayer. Let me give you all 10, 10 truths about prayer. It's a lot. 10 truths. Okay, if you guys want to write this down. Number one is when you're prayerful, you're powerful. When you're prayerful, you're powerful. Okay, we're talking a lot about oil awareness. Somebody that carries the oil, I, you can just tell they spend time with God and they pray. Again, it's not saying I'm, I clocked in 40 hours of prayer this week. Don't be like the heathens out in public showing everybody your timestamps. Just pray, love God, open your heart, cry out to him, ask him for healing, deliverance, ask you to lead him, lead you, guide you, pray over your business, pray over your bank account, pray over your, your family, pray over your children, just pray. When you're prayerful, you're powerful. Another saying is when you're prayerless, you're powerless. That's why you have no power. That's why the devil is, is on you. What's interesting about this saying too, and I once heard this, that a person that doesn't pray will submit to their past lifestyle. A believer that doesn't pray will submit to their past, to their old man, to their past lifestyle. That's why we have to pray doesn't matter how long you've been in church. You have to pray because the old man will continue to come up. When you're prayerful, you're powerful. Number two, prayer changes things. Without it, things change you. Prayer changes things. Without prayer, things change you. We're called to birth hope into atmospheres. We're called to birth glory into atmospheres. We're called to not conform to this world, but when I am not so full, when I'm so full of me, I get influenced by the world because it's me and my flesh-like desires. But we're called to go out there into the world and influence them, not go out into the world and they influence us. Prayer changes things. Without prayer, things change you. That's why your desires keep creeping in. That's why the old man keeps coming in. That's why the irritation keeps creeping in. That's why. Number three. This is for relationships. If bae don't pray, bae ain't bae. Some people don't want to hear that. But I tell people, whew, get somebody that you can pr pray together, slay together. Right? If bae don't pray, bae ain't bae. It's another truth about prayer. Right? I get it. His his beard looks like some fine wine right now, all did and done. Ooh, I could smell the oil, right? But they don't pray. Number four, some people pray and some people pray. Some people pray and some people, P-R-E-Y, pray. Know the difference. Are they praying for your downfall? Are they a Jezebelic type? I don't even know if that's a word. Are they a voice of Jezebel that's shutting the mouth of God's people with threats and witchcraft and manipulation and control and death threats? Are they, are they type, that type of person? Some people pray while some people pray on you, your downfall, your weakness, your wounds. Number five, prayer can move faster than your flesh. Prayer can move faster than your your flesh. I like to say this, seven minutes operating and work and labor in the spirit is greater than seven years of operating and working in the flesh. Seven minutes under the power of the Holy Spirit can get so much more done than seven years of working in the flesh. That's why 
Wilderness is right, right around the corner for you every time. The same trees, the same rocks, the same thing over and over and over and over and over. You're going through that wilderness moment. Prayer can move faster than the flesh. That's number five. Number six, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. If it's big enough to, to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Because the enemy wants you to be consumed with anxiety and worry. But let me just pray this out. I'm going to pray it out and I'm going to slay it out. Whatever this is, I got to pray out that doubt. I got to pray out that anxiety. And these are things I'm giving y'all that I deal with week by week by week. Like this does not discredit or, or, or write off what I go through. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. Number seven, I, I've said it a, a couple times today, pray with me, don't play with me. Because these people looking good on the outside, like you might be pretty, but do you pray? That, 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 that's a whole bar right there. You might be pretty, but do you pray? Pray with me, don't play with me. And that's, that's something like you'd be, you be playing with my feelings. But when you pray to God, my next question is, if they aren't loyal to God, how do you expect them to be loyal to you? It's crazy how the, the believers, we are wanting people to be loyal to us, but if they can't even be loyal to God, red flag, sis, red flag, bro. What in the dysfunction is this type of thinking? What in the confusion is going on in this situation? Like, it sounds so simple, but I get what the enemy does to traffic in delusion, discomfort, and dysfunction. Pray with me. Don't play with me. Number eight. We're almost there. We got 10 keys. Number eight. What we are praying for requires two things. What you're praying for requires discipline and consistency. What you're praying for requires discipline and consistency. You know why? This is how some of us, we're, we're couch potato type of Christians. We just, we just pray, okay, Lord, you better do it. And then we just sit on the couch, eat our hot Cheetos. You got the hot Cheeto dust for evidence that you a couch potato Christian, right? It, being able to say what you're praying for, it's going to require these things, discipline and consistency. Do you want to be a disciple or a Christian? Because there's a difference. A Christian and a disciple, a disciple hears Jesus and obeys Jesus. Scripture is very, very clear about that. Those that obey my words, obey my commandments are my disciples indeed. So it requires discipline as a disciple and consistency, healthy habits, healthy lifestyle, healthy prayer life, healthy cons consumption of the word of God, healthy activation of, allowing, of surrendering to the power of the Holy Spirit. What you're praying for requires both discipline and consistency. Number nine, I had to, I had to throw this in because we always got to thank God, right? So thank God, just thank God, but thank God for living prayers you've prayed for. Thank God for living prayers you've prayed for. Like we're living some prayers that we've prayed for in past seasons to get to know Jesus more, to get to be a little bit healthier, to have a sound mind. And we've probably prayed a prayer in one way but God shows up and packages it in another way. It's still an answer prayer, even though it doesn't look like it. Like I prayed for God to show me and instruct me and lead me and guide me, but he cut off my bestie. Praise the Lord. Because the bestie was a parasite. And what parasites do is they feed off you. So thank God for living prayers that I prayed. Lord, open up the floodgates. God, get me closer to you. He says, hey, the person that I cut off was hindering me getting closer to you and you getting closer to God. So thank God for living prayers you've prayed. We got to thank him. Thank him. We enter into his gates with thanksgiving. When we, when we pray, there's different types of prayers. When we pray, we just start, we, you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the times we open up our prayers by thanking God. If you don't know what to say, just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's not repetitive, okay? That's relationship. Like you're really being thankful. And even though you're not thankful, say it, and you're going to start to believe it, and then you're going to start to live it because your heart is right with God. Thank God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank God for living prayers you pray for. Last one, number 10. 
Ooh, this is my favorite one. Get on your knees and pray. Then get on your feet and work. Get on your knees and pray. Then get on your feet and work. What does that mean? You can be looking at a seed that's on your desk and you can pray until you turn blue and you can have a heart for God. But God is now giving you instruction to take that seed and plant it into good soil. We're not going to do some sorcery, some suit saying to try to lift that thing up and levitate it and try to get it into a, you got to get up, get on your knees and pray. Then get on your feet, take that seed and get to work. We don't advocate lazy Christianity. We, we advocate labor Christianity. Brother RC, where's that in the Bible? Read the whole book of Proverbs. I promise you, you will see laboring Christianity in there. Get on your knees and pray, then get on your feet and work. I'm going to read this last chapter in Psalm 91. Let's go to Psalm 91. So that was 10 truths about prayer. And as I close out today, uh, I just want to share this. And I, I think it's amazing because we talked about this, this secret place, this, this secret room, this inner chamber where, where our heart, our, our inner chamber, our heart aligned, our, our hearts are aligned, this, this secret place, this secret room, this inner chamber. Okay. I pray that none of us feel condemned because there's no condemnation here. Right, And I pray that we can really receive this with an open heart because that's what, what God wants. He, wants. he wants the word of God, which is what a seed, to get sown deep inside of this soil, deep inside of this heart. I'm just going to read this, Psalm 91, verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Secret place, secret place. It is that shelter. It is that hiding place. It is that covering. It's God covering you because you're honoring him. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. I love Psalms 91. If you guys read the rest of it, I love it because it is such a warfare chapter. Like, even though these people are a thousand may fall on my side, 10,000 on my right hand, it's not going to come near me. This is us being able to be in alignment. And I tell people this, the alignment with God is more important than the assignment. Alignment with God is more important than the assignment. Let me give you what that means in the Bible. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. My relationship with God on the cross, with what he did on the cross, that relationship dictates how I also have other healthy relationships here on earth. My relationship with God vertically is what allows me to be anointed to help other people I'm assigned to horizontally. That's what the cross resembles. Like, you know how many people are trying to go out there and, and just try to win souls, but there's no instruction, there's no wisdom to it? So I'm telling people that God needs to give instruction. There's a, there's a saying, I love to say this, that instruction without direction is dysfunction. Like I know so many people, God, God, I hear you. God, I know that Bible verse. God, I've read Matthew 6, 6 all the time. God, I know. God, I know. God, I hear. Instruction without direction is dysfunction. We need God's direction. And I'll, I'll close out in this verse in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says to trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct. God bless you. He will direct. He will direct. How many people are leaning, are leaning, leaning with it, rocking with it on our own understanding? How many of us are just leaning on this right here? We're, we're, that's what you do when you can't lean. You're either leaning on God or something else. Lean not on thy own understanding. This is why I got to trust him with all thy heart. <laughs> Closing out. And it's, it's very simple today. A very simple close out today. And then we'll call if anyone, anyone needs prayer. I feel like there's a few people that might need some prayer, but it's between you and the Lord. A man of God was once asked, he was once asked, what do you gain when you pray? 
What do you gain? And this could have this could have came from an unbeliever. This could have came from somebody that's like they pray. Let me just give you guys a quick testimony. When I first came here in 2018, we'd open up in prayer when we're at when we're opening up the store. We open up the store, and we open up in prayer. Pastor comes back two hours later. Let's pray. I'm like it's lunchtime. Like we're okay. Let's pray. Pastor comes back at two three o'clock. Let's pray. Pastor comes back at five o'clock. Let's pray. We're closing at seven. Let's pray. And I'm like. And we're doing this every single day, day by day, week by week, month by month, all throughout the day. And me, I'm still a babe in Christ. I'm still learning the ropes of the kingdom. And I'm like, why do we pray so much? Why do we pray? And I've adapted that lifestyle of the importance of what prayer does. And if it wasn't for those prayers in this, that season that are answered prayers in this season, I can only imagine where, we're, where we'd be today. But that's the power of prayer. A man of God was once asked, what do you gain when you pray? Because a lot of us, we want to gain something when we do things to God. We have a transactional relationship with God. What do I gain when I pray, God? What do I gain? What do I gain? And you know what the man of God said? The man of God said one word, nothing. And the guy was confused. He goes, wait, so you're telling me that you pray all the time and you're praying and I'm asking you, what do you get from praying and you don't get nothing? What a fool. He says, yeah, I don't gain anything. But then he says, but let me tell you what I do, what I lose. I lose fear. I lose anxiety. I lose, I lose self-righteousness. I lose unbelief. I lose doubt. I lose depression. I lose suicidal thoughts. I lose the things that the world has indoctrinated me. I've, I lose some things. And when we can see that sometimes it's not always what we get, but it might be th things that we forget. Your walk with God will be so much different. I don't know what religion has done to you. I don't know what other churches have done to you. I don't know what other pastors or teachers or dysfunctional devils have done and said to you. But when you have an encounter with the one living true God, you'll never be the same. You'll never allow man to dictate your walk with God. And that's what we really strive for here. It's for people to have a real relationship with, with, with the Lord. That's why it's called a relationship. Real relationship with the Christ. So what do you gain when you pray? What do you gain when you obey? What do you gain when you fast? It might not always be something that we gain because we're, we're in a society where we, we want something, but what if it's something you lose? What profits a man that gains the whole world but loses their soul? That's a total other, other twist. Meaning we gain things just for the profit of ourselves in the, in the process where we're also losing the parts of us that's the God in us. So there's this balance. And I've gone through both sides. I, I've done a lot of these things where I've, I've tried to profit off things and it, it, you lose your soul in the process. It's vanity. It's all vanity. God, we just thank you. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for your word. We thank